All right, it's time for our second uh, speaker for the day, uh, Francesca Vidotto. We are very happy to welcome you today. Uh, thanks a lot for being here with us today. And thanks a lot for uh, inviting me and for having me in this beautiful place uh, with uh, a lot of wonderful conver conversations. And um, well, I, I usually play the part of uh, the physicist uh, telling uh, to the fellow physicists uh, how important it is to be clear about uh, our metaphysical assumptions, but <laughs> to this audience is like <laughs> preaching to the converted. Uh, but I, I still think that um, it's good to, to remind this uh, it, because uh, I, I was having a conversation um, uh, um, with Barry the other day that was about uh, um, exactly or oh, I wanted to understand what the world is made of and then I wanted to verify what is there and uh, the problem is that uh, we can have uh, a set of data available to us and then uh, we can still have uh, different interpretation of the data or if you want uh, uh, this data may fit with uh, different metaphysical assumptions but then uh, as often in this case so this is an example like uh, 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 until uh, you have uh, a better way to test your theory, you, you have uh, uh, data about uh, the motion of planets in the sky, uh, you see maybe some uh, retrograde motion, and of course you can choose uh, uh, to interpret this uh, e uh, using um, uh, um, uh, using a Ptolemaic uh, or uh, a heliocentric uh, um, uh, system uh, and uh, I mean the question is which one fit bet uh, better the data uh, possibly the Ptolemaic one would even fit the data better uh, would fit uh, what you see with your sense better but then uh, uh, the two of them uh, have uh, different metaphysical commitments and in the end what makes you choose between different metaphysical commitments uh, is the fruitfulness uh, so it's an a posteriori um, uh, thing that you do uh, looking backward uh, uh, to which metaphysical commitments uh, have led uh, to the successful physics uh, uh, that you say okay this is uh, um, the one that uh, uh, I will commit to um, so when it comes to quantum gravity, you can ask uh, what's the situation? Uh, the usual story is that oh, we don't have uh, empirical access to quantum gravity and uh, well of course you can say that uh, uh, we cannot make experiments uh, directly uh, at the Planck scale but it's not true that we are uh, uh, completely uh, without uh, indications. So there are many indications of uh, how uh, the quantum theory of gravity should be because we have constraints. We have uh, a large <coughs> number of observations. Uh, we have, um, so we want our theory to fit with these observations. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, uh, as in the case uh, of, uh, um, of uh, uh, the, the planets in the sky and their motion, uh, we are in a situation in which uh, we don't know yet with which uh, metaphysical commitments uh, are the ones that are guiding uh, in the right direction uh, to bring us to the successful uh, um, um, succeeding uh, theory. So the, in, uh, um, in the current situation, uh, till when we, we have better uh, data, so what we have to do is indeed uh, to look at uh, what are uh, the, uh, the different metaphysical uh, um, commitments that one can take uh, and uh, try to compare them and try to be guided by them. Uh, my point of view in, in this is that uh, um, so you, when you do quantum gravity, you cannot uh, uh, rely on a metaphysics that is based just on uh, uh, one theory like uh, uh, quantum mechanics or just one theory like uh, general relativity. So of course you want to pick up an ontology uh, or a meta metaphysical commitments that are compatible with all the different uh, uh, parts of knowledge uh, that uh, uh, constitutes uh, uh, current, uh, uh, the current understanding of physics. So, um, so the plan for this, my original plan for this talk was to um, to discuss how 
in my opinion, a relational ontology is uh, uh, transversal to uh, its present in all these uh, different fields of modern physics, and so could be uh, the right one that uh, uh, we can use when we do quantum gravity. But then, since uh, this conference is specifically about uh, the metaphysics beyond space-time, so somehow uh, it's really into the metaphysics of, uh, uh, of, of quantum gravity, I will try to, to go more into the details uh, of, um, of loop quantum gravity, try to give some more uh, um, details uh, regarding the theory that uh, Carlo was catching in, in the talk before me. Yet I cannot resist uh, 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 discussing um, very briefly uh, how, uh, how the metaphysics of uh, um, quantum gravity stays together with uh, all uh, uh, the other information uh, about a possible ontology of the world uh, with respect to um, the other theories. And of course, we can see this uh, in an historical manner. Uh, I think it's very important to have clear what's, uh, um, what is uh, the idea uh, behind uh, um, general relativity in particular, because this is going to uh, guide us uh, in, uh, for quantum gravity. So if I have to summarize in one sentence uh, what is the discovery of general relativity, general relativity is the discovery that uh, space-time uh, is uh, itself uh, a field, so a substance, and so there is an equivalence between gravity, geometry, and a field. So uh, there is this uh, convergence uh, between the notion of fields and the notion of space-time, and we can bring them together in, the, in a unique object that, that are general covariant fields. Now, careful, uh, of course, we have learned this uh, for, quantum, uh, for, uh, for general relativity, but in principle, you can recast uh, any, uh, any field in a general covariant language. Uh, so it's just that in general relativity, you're really obliged to work in such a framework, uh, while uh, if you do so with other fields, it could be more cumbersome. So on the other hand, with quantum mechanics, that here I mean in a very uh, generalized way, so including in the quantum theory, I include also uh, the, uh, uh, not just uh, the discovery that uh, uh, particle, um, so, so not just the quantum theory uh, in terms of quantum mechanics, but uh, the quantum theory also in a generalized way, uh, including quantum field theory. And when I go to quantum field theory, namely, I make uh, my quantum theory compatible with the discovery that uh, there is uh, space-time, so uh, I make my theory compatible with special relativity, then I discover also that uh, particles are manifestation of fields, uh, and this tells us that an ontology based on particles is not going to be successful. So I need to, uh, to do something else. So when I, uh, when I go into into uh, quantum gravity. The idea is uh, quantum gravity is a summary of everything that we have learned about what the world is made of. So is the idea that uh, uh, we can, it's not just the idea that we can uh, describe uh, um, the quantum properties of the gravitational field, it's also the idea that I can have a formalism in which uh, I can uh, talk about quantum fields uh, in a general covariant manner, so without uh, relying on uh, a background or a choice of coordinates. Uh, so I was arg arguing that uh, relationality is uh, the uh, common ground, the common elements uh, uh, between uh, all these different theories, starting from uh, uh, classical mechanics, uh, looking at uh, um, uh, Galilean relativity. I, I think that unless we digest what we mean uh, by relationalism, uh, um, by relational physical quantities, starting with things like velocity, uh, we cannot understand all uh, that comes next. Uh, so Carlo was making the example before of exactly of velocity. Velocity, it's a relational property. Uh, this doesn't mean uh, that it is uh, subjective or anything. Uh, so, but the great discovery is that uh, 
all properties, not just velocity, all properties in physics uh, have some uh, have a fundamental relational uh, uh, nature. Uh, going uh, from uh, uh, from, as I said, from, uh, uh, from Galilean relativity to general relativity to quantum field theory. I wanted to go directly uh, to this because I was mentioning that uh, an ontology of a particle doesn't work well uh, in, uh, uh, for quantum fields, uh, but it's more than this because, uh, so uh, when we think, uh, so if we try to think uh, um, uh, uh, about what the world is made of in terms of uh, uh, particles. Uh, so we soon discover that uh, in our contemporary theory, this uh, notion is not well defined. It's not well defined because uh, the number of particles that are there, it's uh, in itself a relational, uh, a relational uh, um, property. First, because I can choose different observables. So, pick, so we were discussing before about the fact that we we, when we define a quantum theory, we have to pick up an algebra of observables. And when we pick up these uh, observables, well, there are different ways in which we can define uh, a number operator. And uh, this number operator can give us uh, different answers with respect to how many particles there are there in my system. So this is already at uh, the level of quantum field theory, but then if you put uh, your quantum fields uh, into a curved background, then there are also other problems arising because the number of particles there depends uh, on uh, uh, the, um, the state uh, of uh, the observer, whether an observer is accelerating or not. So an observer that uh, uh, in a certain state uh, see no particle at all, so in the moment in which it starts to accelerate, uh, um, starts to detect uh, many more particles. So, so the particles that are basically uh, the one that gives you a certain Uru temperature. So particles, uh, particles are great, by the way, because uh, uh, it's not that they wanted to dismiss them. They are uh, uh, embodying uh, the, uh, a very important property of uh, our fundamental theories, that is discreteness. So we wanted to put discrete discreteness as uh, one of the foundations, one of the guidance for the construction of our theories. But at the same time, we have to be careful with it. Exactly because uh, 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 there is a dependence and, th and this dependence is connected with uh, the choice uh, of uh, uh, observables and we say that, that observables are somehow what, uh, something that is picked up by uh, the theory that we, we, we want to, uh, to describe, we, we want to deal with, but for the same system, we can have also, we can pick up another theory, we can pick up other ways in which we interact with the system, and this gives uh, different uh, um, answers. So I want just to go very quickly, um, because Carlo has already talked about this. There is a relationality in quantum mechanics, and there is a re relationality in general relativity. The relationality that we see uh, uh, in quantum mechanics uh, seems to be a feature of many different theories, uh, uh, many different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Uh, is of course, uh, the relational interpretation uh, uh, puts uh, uh, the relationality at the center of the discussion, but relationality is already there in uh, other uh, interpretation, starting with Copenhagen or the many words one. So there is the rationality in the relative states uh, of uh, Everett. And uh, again, so the point is that uh, quantum states are always relative. They depend uh, on uh, a, an observer. Well, the difference, uh, uh, the peculiarity of relational quantum mechanics is the fact that uh, the observer is not uh, necessarily a conscious agent, uh, but it's, there is a democratization of observers. So the observer is uh, any system that is uh, in interaction uh, with uh, the system that is observed. Uh, and uh, the ontology in this case, in the relational interpretation, is not an ontology of uh, quantum states, uh, is uh, more an ontology of uh, uh, facts. 
the ontology is derived uh, by the classical theory in the sense that if I wanted to say what uh, is the theory about, well, the theory is about those physical quantities uh, that are already present uh, in the classical theory. So the, when uh, you learn uh, Dirac quantization uh, at school, uh, well, you, you take uh, physical quantities uh, such as uh, position and momentum uh, or angular momentum and so on, and you put a hat on them. But uh, so you're not uh, choosing the semantic of the theory, you take the semantic from the classical uh, uh, world, and then um, uh, the ontology is uh, therefore dependent on, on them, even though we can say that the resulting ontology is, of course, uh, uh, weaker. Uh, Carlo has this way to uh, to call uh, the elements of the of reality in this interpretation that are facts, uh, and facts are like, uh, for example, the fact that the particle is measured here or is measured here, or the fact that uh, uh, we were saying before that uh, the um, magnetic field has a certain value in this direction and another value in another direction. All these things are facts that uh, constitute the ontology of my theory. And again, I wanted to uh, I stress once more that if you wanted to define what the quantum theory is, uh, you need to uh, have this uh, triplet. We, you need a uh, Hilbert space, uh, that is where the states live, but then the states by themselves or the wave function by their itself uh, has not enough information about the world. You want uh, a semantic that is given by the algebra of observables that you have to pick up. And uh, you need a dynamics. And dynamics that tells you how, uh, <laughs> how uh, the system uh, evolved. And I will make uh, uh, more comments about this uh, in a moment. So I want to stress this because uh, this is uh, uh, the structure that I want to reproduce in a quantum theory of gravity. In a quantum theory of gravity, what I need are exactly these ingredients specialized for the gravitational field. Uh, I want to just, I cannot resist to say one thing at this point, uh, because uh, of course, uh, uh, part of uh, the construction of a theory of quantum uh, of mechanics and quantum mechanics has to do with the symplectic structure of the theory. And uh, I was inspired by uh, what Faye was saying yesterday regarding uh, 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 being and becoming, uh, and uh, this is a topic that is very, uh, that puzzles me, that uh, I would like to investigate better, but it seems to me that uh, uh, all our theories, our current theories in physics are based on this notion of symplectic geometry. And in symplectic geometry, there is a, a, a democratization between uh, position and momentum, uh, in a very, and where by position and momentum, uh, I mean uh, this in a very generalized uh, uh, way. So in uh, quantum gravity, the position uh, is the value of the gravitational field in the forms of uh, uh, the densitized triads, uh, and the momentum is the value of the curvature of, of the connection. But basically, this is giving you the curvature. So, and, so this couple of objects somehow embody in a modern way this notion of being and becoming, but they are completely dual to one another. So I can make a canonical transformation and reverse them, and reverse the sense in which one is being and one is becoming. And um, I think that this is something that <laughs> needs to be investigated more. And uh, again, I wanted to stress this because uh, uh, we need uh, this structure in quantum gravity. We want this structure to go into the quantum theory of gravity in the sense that uh, a passage uh, uh, to construct the quantization of gravity is uh, to look at general relativity and see what is the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity. What are the good variables in general relativity so that the theory is written uh, in an Hamiltonian form? And so then you discover that rather than uh, using uh, uh, the metric field, you want, so rather to use the metric, you want to use uh, uh, reference fields, uh, the tetrads. Uh, 
that are more rich uh, as objects than the, uh, than the metric. In fact, there is, uh, uh, th there is double the information, if you want, in the, in the tetrads. Of course, uh, you can, given the tetrads, you can always uh, uh, get back to, uh, to the metric. So, but again, but, but vice versa. So the metric uh, maps into uh, twice, <laughs> um, into two different versions of, uh, two different choices of, of uh, sign for, for the tetrads. And you discover that the conjugate variable to this uh, is the, the spin connections, so that has to do with the, the curvature. So I think this is, uh, so the way in which I teach uh, uh, um, general relativity um, to my students uh, is really uh, tell that uh, general relativity is this discovery in which uh, you have uh, this notion of fields, uh, you have uh, fields uh, that are scalar fields, uh, you have vector fields, and then you have this new object that are tensor fields, uh, where, uh, where you are promoting uh, the reference frames uh, to fields th their self. So this is my if you want the basic ontology of re general relativity is this one, is, are the reference frames that have also already a, a notion of geometry uh, um, uh, embodying them, and they have already a symmetries already present there. Uh, and uh, with uh, these uh, two conjugate variables, uh, I can write uh, an action for general relativity. And well, if you wanted to do loop quantum gravity, you want to, uh, to have the action written with this uh, term that is called the Holtz term that does nothing at the classical level but has an important role uh, in the quantum theory. So, okay, uh, I have already been uh, saying things about uh, general relativity. We know that general relativity is relational. Uh, is relational because uh, uh, localization uh, is uh, um, always uh, uh, dependent, uh, is also always uh, uh, obtained uh, in uh, uh, by um, but by taking uh, um, well is always defined in a relational way, uh, but I wanted to stress other aspects that uh, uh, gives uh, that spoke uh, speak about the relationality of the theory. First of all, the idea that uh, we have to think of gravity as a gauge theory. So this is already a step uh, towards. Uh, thinking of the gravitational field on the same foot uh, of, uh, all the other, um, of all the other fields. So that uh, is this idea for which uh, rather than having uh, the fields uh, living on uh, a fixed uh, space-time, you rather have fields on fields, uh, fields in interaction with one another. So when we talk about uh, a field uh, being a matter field, um, the electromagnetic field having a certain value in X, what we are actually meaning is that the electromagnetic field has a certain value with respect to the gravitational field. Um, and so there is a... a so I wanted to, to work with a, 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 in a perspective in which, uh, the one that I was telling you before, a, a framework in which everything that exists, everything that I want to talk about uh, are fields that are general covariant, so they don't depend on the coordinates, but I define them uh, one with respect to the other. And so uh, I have only interacting gauge fields. Now, all these fields are characterized uh, by some symmetries, uh, and maybe, um, okay, I will say something more about symmetry in a second. I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, something that has been uh, uh, mentioned in uh, yesterday, that was this uh, tension between uh, substantivalism and relationalism. So if you look at uh, general relativity in this way, you will see that, of course, uh, the gravitational field is a substance, of course, is a substance that uh, comes into being uh, uh, only through its relations. Uh, and again, it's, um, I can look at this uh, uh, from the perspective of gravity as being a gauge theory, and gauge is always embodying interactions, relations, and so on. Uh, one one, um, one element, uh, one information more uh, regarding than uh, 
uh, how I go into a quantum gravity theory. I mentioned, um, I mentioned the, the role of symmetry. Um, gravity is a, gauge, uh, is a gauge theory, but in fact there are two different symmetries that characterize this theory. One symmetry is the one uh, of diffeomorphism, so um, the, the covariance, the independence uh, from coordinates. But uh, if I, when, I, when I think of... Uh, um, so I, I really think that uh, there should be a sense in which uh, um, I can uh, describe all fields uh, as uh, uh, background independence, as independence from the coordinates. So if then I have really to, to say what is the gauge here, I would say that it's the Lorentz symmetry that characterizes my theory. And uh, that's why uh, in loop quantum gravity, uh, we start, so one way to characterize loop quantum gravity is that is a theory in which you use group variables. So this is a difference with respect to other approaches to quantum gravity. Group variable, so we want to write uh, uh, general relativity as a gauge theory. We want therefore to choose uh, uh, what are the um, canonical variables. The canonical variables uh, are uh, uh, given by group variables. I, I told you before that uh, um, general relativity is basically a theory in which I promote uh, my reference fields uh, uh, to uh, my, sorry, I promote my reference frames to fields, but these reference frames uh, have uh, already in them uh, the, uh, this, uh, the information about uh, uh, the Lorentz uh, symmetry. It's easier to understand this uh, one dimension less. So at a given time, you take the reference frames uh, and uh, for each element uh, of, uh, of your space, uh, um, you associate the reference frame, but uh, you have uh, a choice of how you orient these reference frames. So there is uh, a, a, an invariance by rotations. So my fundamental, uh, my fundamental symmetry is uh, the rotational one, well, or double covering of the rotation group that is SU2, uh, with uh, its conjugate uh, variable. Oh, actually, a uh, small note, so you, when you work with, uh, um, with the, uh, group variables in uh, a canonical context, uh, when you have a group variable, usually you have uh, the conjugate variable that is in the algebra. There is a way in which you can do, uh, you can have the, the full duality, the full symmetry between uh, position and momentum. So you can have uh, both variables that are in the group. And once you do so, it's beautiful because the, mathematically, uh, the mathematics gets a bit more cumbersome. But then uh, what you gain is that you can have uh, the cosmological constant in the theory that comes uh, as an effect of the finiteness of your theory. And this is, I don't want to go into this, but I, I just wanted to make uh, a small parenthesis, uh, exactly because I was mentioning uh, the importance to look at uh, uh, the, the symplectic structure and, uh, and this duality uh, between um, position and momentum variables. So what about the other, oh, sorry. What about the other uh, gauge, the other symmetry, the diff invariant ones? So the, I have uh, this uh, Lorentzian symmetry that is uh, the fundamental one. It, this is the symmetry, uh, so because uh, then I have the appearance of SU2 here, uh, you know that the quantization uh, of uh, SU2 brings uh, uh, a discrete spectrum. So this is where the discreteness of the theory comes from. And, uh, it's important to realize that this is a, a quantum discreteness that doesn't break Lorentz invariance. In the same way in which uh, when you do uh, the quantization of uh, the angular momentum, uh, of course, you, if you have a system with a quantized angular momentum, so you have discrete uh, values of the angular momentum, what if you make uh, a, a, a change of uh, uh, basis uh, in this context. Well, the, your spectrum uh, is still discrete. What changes is that uh, you have different probabilities for the different eigenvalues. So 
the quantum discreteness that we have in quantum gravity works in a similar manner because uh, you have uh, a quantum discreteness of space-time itself, but when you make a boost, namely when you change your basis, uh, you still have a discrete spectrum. And again, this is not breaking uh, the symmetry of the theory, it's just uh, giving you different probabilities for different eigenvalues. Uh, this is very important because if you are introducing uh, um, the discreteness in your quantum gravity theory in other ways, uh, not at the quantum level with this uh, gauge structure, but imposing uh, uh, discreteness somehow by hands, indeed you can incur into problems with, uh, um, with the Lorentz invariance. And here instead uh, what I'm saying is that the loop quantum gravity is a theory that respects Lorentz invariance and in fact is based on the Lorentz symmetry. But let me go back to the previous uh, uh, point. So there are two symmetries, uh, the Lorentz one, uh, and uh, there are also diffeomorphism. What about diffeomorphism? Well, uh, I wanted to um, I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, uh, so at this level, uh, in this description, uh, I I'm starting with a theory that is uh, uh, not general relativity in the sense that there is no manifold, uh, there, is, uh, um, there, are, there are some properties uh, of uh, the classical space-time that are not there, but there are other properties that are already there, in the sense that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Lorentz symmetry is already there at a the fundamental level in the theory. So if you want uh, we, if we wanted to make an ontology of loop quantum gravity and say what are the fundamental aspects of it, what is already there from the beginning, uh, as opposed to what is emergent there in the theory, well, you start uh, with uh, the Lorentz symmetry. You start also with a given uh, dimensionality of your theory, because talking about the Lorentz group implies that there are four dimensions. And that there are also other properties that are already there. And one of these properties is, uh, is adjacency. So what you uh, want your space-time to do is to tell you uh, who is next to, uh, to, somebody, to which system is next to another. So you want this notion of adjacency to be already present there at the fundamental level, even if you don't have uh, a, a, a differ differential ball structure. And that's why we introduce uh, graphs. So graphs here are uh, an ancillary structure that is encoding adjacency relation, but uh, it's a way to encode adjacency relation without uh, talking about, uh, um, about uh, uh, coordinates. So the graph in itself is uh, automatically a diff invariant uh, object uh, that allows me to talk about uh, one of the main properties of, uh, of space-time, uh, the adjacency, in a, in a, in a way that uh, is uh, invariant by diffeomorphism and doesn't need to have uh, this heavy structure of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the manifold. So then the question, one of the question, yes? Sorry, in the previous slide, uh, so No, sorry, uh, which one? This, this one is, uh, um, sorry. Uh, oh, the, the little L. No, this is a, uh, it's the label of the links. So, okay, so the, I have this Hilbert space in which I have a, a SU2 decoration for. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, okay, have you, yep, <laughs> better, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so the, the resulting Hilbert space uh, is the Hilbert sp is the same Hilbert space that you have uh, in uh, lattice gauge theories, uh, or um, for instance, uh, like you have in lattice QCD, in which you have uh, a, a graph, so a lattice, uh, in which uh, uh, for each link, uh, you have a decoration with one of these uh, gauge variables. So the little l represents for, for each of these links, uh, 
I have uh, a SU2 uh, group uh, element, but then uh, this, there is a quotient in the definition of this uh, Hilbert space because I want uh, gauge invariant, uh, SU2 gauge invariant at each node. So I wanted to compose uh, all the, the di these different uh, SU2 representations in a way that uh, remains gauge invariant. So the definition of my states uh, is in terms of representation of SU2, but that should be compatible with the fundamental gauge invariant of the theory. So then, and the, the basis in the Hilbert space is given uh, by this uh, object that is the graph uh, with uh, spins, uh, namely the spins that characterize the representation of, uh, of SU2, one for each link, and then uh, I have also a value um, uh, uh, so I have this gauge invariance at the nodes, and on each node uh, I can therefore have a quantum number that is associated with the nodes, and something that I was about to go into <laughs> is the fact that um, I have areas associated with the links and uh, volumes associated with the nodes. Well, uh, it's diffeomorphic in the sense that it uh, um, doesn't matter how you deform uh, this uh, graph. Uh, all, so all it's, it's yeah, so it's everything it's coded uh, in, uh, in these relations. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, and if you, I wanted to go uh, on this in a, in, in a moment. Uh, let me see if I have, a, no, I don't, I don't have it. Maybe yes, just a second. I should have a, a slide on this. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that you can have uh, you can have uh, uh, so yeah. Okay, there is nothing deeper than this uh, in the sense that uh, um, the graph in itself that does a, is not a graph that leaves uh, on some uh, um, underlying manifold. In fact, well, when you wanted to describe uh, the uh, classical limit of the theory, indeed, then you can do this operation of embed the graph into a manifold. But this is not necessary uh, at the level of uh, uh, the definition of the theory. Something that you do later when you want to recover the classical limit. And that is what I was uh, showing here, that you can write coherent states. Uh, and uh, in order to give uh, a uh, so you do coherent states like you do all the time in quantum mechanics, uh, except that uh, you have gauge variables, but that there is uh, a proper definition of uh, coherent states uh, for, uh, uh, for, gauge uh, for, uh, for group variables, sorry. Um, and uh, of, so in the moment in which you want uh, to give uh, a full geometrical interpretation so of these states, well, what you can do is <laughs> to describe them is to embed them into some uh, manifold. So then there is a clear sense in which uh, you can talk about um, uh, a, a, about the geometrical quantities uh, such as uh, area, curvature, and so on. And you can really... Uh, uh, here there is a step uh, that uh, uh, I am uh, skipping, that is that, uh, so for each, uh, I can think, uh, I can take the dual graph to this one, uh, so I can associate uh, an area to one of, the, of these links, and there is uh, a beautiful uh, uh, classical theorem by Minkowski, that tells that, uh, so given, uh, given a set of uh, uh, vectors uh, that sum up to zero, you have uniquely associated uh, a, uh, a polyhedron. So given this structure, there is already a, a notion of geometry that is associated to it. Uh, and uh, in the moment in which I promote uh, uh, my uh, this uh, sum of vectors. I promote uh, each of these vectors to operator, putting a hat on them. So basically, I take these L capital L variables and I put a hat on them. Um, I have a version 
of uh, this uh, Minkowski theorem, in which instead of having uh, a classical polyhedra associated to each node, I have a quantum fuzzy polyhedra associated to each node, and this is uh, uh, the so-called Perros theorem that was discovered in the, in the 70s. So again, when we think about uh, what is fundamental in quantum gravity and what is emergent, well, you see that there is, uh, as I said, there is already uh, there, are, there is the Lorentz symmetry, uh, there is adjacency, there is a notion of geometry that is already present uh, within this structure. So one uh, uh, may ask, uh, what, is, uh, what is missing here with respect to, uh, to the full, um, uh, to the full uh, oops, sorry, with respect to, to, the, full, uh, uh, to the full theory? And then let me go directly. Um, let me go directly to this. So, uh, so what is missing with respect to the full uh, um, the full theory is uh, a classical limit. So the classical limit can be achieved the first uh, through. Uh, defining coherent states, as we have seen, but this is just uh, uh, something you do at the kinematical level. The full classical limit has to do with, uh, uh, also with the dynamics of the theory. And uh, um, so, so uh, what I wanted to do when I take the, the classical limit is exactly the same thing as I do with usual uh, uh, quantum fields. So, so when we quantize fields such as uh, the electromagnetic one, uh, we start with, uh, um, uh, with a classical field, and then uh, we, uh, we describe the quantum version of, of this field, uh, as we said before, with these triplets, in which you have uh, your Hilbert space, that is, for instance, the Fox spa uh, space, the algebra observables that tells you how many that creates uh, and destruct and uh, uh, and kills the quanta of the electromagnetic fields, and then you have the dynamics that is given by Feynman rules. So from uh, a, a, a continuous uh, uh, um, theory, you go to a theory in which you have this fundamental discreteness, and then you can take vice versa the classical limit. Uh, by the way, this is not completely well de uh, defined mathematically, so it's not so easy <laughs> to go from uh, photons uh, to uh, the Maxwell equation, but you trust that this uh, should be done. And similarly, in uh, loop quantum gravity, what you do is that uh, you go from a theory that is general relativity that is uh, small, in which you have uh, a space-time that is smooth and continuous, uh, to a theory in which uh, uh, you have discreteness. So you have a quanta of space-time, except that now uh, your quanta are not living on some background, but they are making up uh, space-time itself. So vice versa, you want to recover uh, general relativity going from uh, this quanta of space-time uh, to uh, the classical equation. And the way in which you do this uh, is by taking uh, the limit uh, of h bar that goes to zero, or namely the limit uh, in which uh, the fundamental uh, quantity of the theory that is the Planck length goes to zero. Uh, something that, um, so you can interpret this uh, as uh, uh, a, a large distance limit. So you scale uh, uh, your system uh, and when the system became macroscopic is when it reaches uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, classical, uh, the classical limit and well, uh, this has been done. Uh, so this is something that you have to do at the level of the dynamics and this has been studied uh, uh, some more than 10 years ago, establishing that uh, uh, the classical limit of uh, the theory was given by a discretized version of, uh, of the action for general relativity. Why discretized? Because uh, um, what I was saying before is that uh, we, have, uh, we have introduced the, the graph 
to account for uh, uh, adjacencies. Uh, but so if you want, uh, while uh, this, uh, the discreteness that comes from the presence of the Lorentz group is uh, fundamental, it gives a genuine quantum discreteness, the, the presence of this graph uh, also introduces a form of discreteness, but is, uh, um, it's a form of cutoff. In the same way in which uh, you can do uh, the quantization of the electromagnetic field, or you can decide that you do the quantization of the electromagnetic field in a box. And the box itself uh, introduces uh, a, a, a discreteness in, in your theory. And you have to distinguish between the discreteness that is given by uh, the jumps between different energy levels of your field and the discreteness that is uh, comes from the truncation that. Uh, that comes with, uh, uh, with being in the box. So when we take the classical limit of the theory, we recover the theory inside the box. So you may want to recover also the classical limit, but the classical, uh, sorry, not just the classical limit, you want to recover the continuous limit. And, uh, um, and the continuous limit is given uh, um, Uh, so is given exactly by, uh, by taking the limit uh, for uh, a graph uh, that is, it's a, the, the limit that we were talking before, it's a limit in which uh, your graph gets uh, uh, larger and larger, or maybe more and more complex. Uh, and uh, it's a formal limit uh, in the sense, yes, it's a formal limit in the sense that uh, it's a, theory, it's a limit that you want to have in the theory for the theory to be well defined, but at the same time, uh, I would say that is not really a physical uh, limit uh, in the sense that, uh, of course, you are truncating the degrees of freedom of your theory for <coughs> convenience, uh, but you're, you can also think of the truncation as being uh, uh, fundamental because uh, uh, in the end, your gravitational field, your total field is made by, um, is realized by elementary quanta. So uh, if, you, if the universe is finite, there could be only a finite number of quantas inside it. So I, I, th and, um, I wanted to connect with what Carlo was saying before, that uh, uh, the theory is uh, described by processes, processes in which the states uh, are on the boundary, and the space-time is this uh, process uh, in the between. But then, uh, so uh, there is this uh, beautiful identification between, uh, between uh, uh, this process uh, and, the, uh, and the geometries uh, that interpolates uh, um, between the states uh, that uh, are somehow the, the, the Feynman diagrams of, uh, of my theory. So the graph that I used to interpolate between uh, uh, one state on the boundary and another state of the boundary. So the graph that I need to increase more and more uh, to get towards the continuum limit is also uh, corresponds to an expansion in which, uh, um, in which uh, is like getting more and more uh, uh, vertex or making uh, like the, the, the expansion that we have uh, in quantum field theory with uh, Feynman diagrams that are more and more complicated. So I think that uh, uh, my time uh, is more than <laughs> than um, than uh, uh, finished. Um, maybe, where should I, uh, where should I uh, conclude? I should conclude saying that uh, uh, there is a, um, so in the theory that I discussed in the end of my talk, uh, there is a sense in which uh, uh, taking a relational perspective uh, is uh, the, um, the, the ground from we, that allows uh, to make the step towards the construction of such a theory. Of course, as Carlo was saying, maybe people can arrive to similar conclusions and, and similar theory from different uh, point of view, but it seems to me that this 
relational attitude is the one that is really being uh, the most fruitful it's, and is the one that is guiding us not just for uh, constructing the theory but also for uh, doing concrete calculations for instance in cosmology black holes uh, doing phenomenology again uh, the the problem is that uh, what will decide what is the good metaphysics what I, what is the good attitude uh, to construct the theory well i have the impression that uh, we can only answer this a posteriori when we will have a more well-defined and established theory of quantum gravity. So thanks a lot, Francesca. So this was very, very interesting and very, very deep. Um, I'll try to make some very, uh, mostly to ask you some very general questions on things that I would be kind of interested in understanding better regarding how this, this sort of theory works and sort of how these relational ontology is related to it. Uh, the first question that, that comes to my mind is actually related to something that came, out, uh, came up yesterday in regards, I think, also to Chris's talk, um, which is what exactly is a model in a theory like this. So what I'm thinking is the following. So uh, yesterday, Chris was kind of uh, explaining Kind of how, how one might think of models in general relativity, and usually one would associate, uh, one would say that a model in general relativity is something like a four dimensional Lorentz space time. Um, in this context of LQG, we're kind of working always within this um, boundary formalism. So we, we always deal with regions of space time, we never, re we never really deal with the entire space time as a whole. So, in some sense, how do, how do we define a model here? in a way that is analogous to, the, if we can, in a way that is analogous to the general relativistic case. So we cannot really speak of the entire space-time, I guess, at least not in quantum gravitational terms, because we're always dealing with a, with a bounded region. How, how do we find a, a, a notion of model in this theory that matches, the, if we can, to the general relativistic one? And if not, what does that tell us about how, for example, we might want to model modality in this sort of theory? So that was one thing. Um, another thing was just a very small curiosity regarding um, something that you mentioned at the beginning uh, regarding relationality in quantum field theory uh, and how it relates, actually, how it relates to LQG and how it kind of relates to the classical limit of LQG. So what I was thinking, and you're free to just tell me that I'm confused and, <laughs> and I didn't understand how this works. But when you were speaking about QFT, you are kind of mentioning how, for example, we can have a relational notion of particle in QFT, and how in QFT in curved space time, we don't have a preferred vacuum, and we can have a sort of, I guess, relational notion of vacuum. Um, so the first part of the question is, does the same thing happen in LQG? So we, do we have a relational notion of vacuum? And if we have a relational notion of vacuum, would this mean that in the classical limit, for example, different ob observers, let's call them, would see different space-time geometries, uh, depending on which vacuum actually is the one that like, they relationally uh, connect with? Um, and again, if that is the case, and free, feel free to tell me that it's not the case, uh, what does it tell us about the ontology of this theory? Like, the, like space-time geometry is a fully relational concept to the point that different observables just see completely different space-time geometries to the extent that they have different vacua. And the final thing uh, was something that um, I was kind, kind of thinking here at the end of your, of your talk, and I think uh, Baptiste uh, was, was mentioning yesterday at dinner, um, which is that... Um, so in many ways, it seems that the sort of relational ontology that you described and that Carol described before um, ends up being very, very, very much tied with loop quantum gravity, at least when you try to use it in quantum gravity. Um, so the question is, how, how um, connected are the two? So if I find the relational ontology interesting and compelling, should I then feel a strong push towards uh, believing in something like loop quantum gravity? Or can we give, for example, relational interpretations of other quantum gravity theories, something like string theory, or uh, causal set theory, or other more general quantum gravity theory? So how, how tightly connected is the relational ontology to loop quantum gravity? And uh, that's it, I guess. So thanks all for the talk again.
So thank you, Enrico, because these are great, all great questions. And uh, I think it's a, they are a very good way to start our discussion. So your first question was uh, about uh, the use uh, of uh, a, a boundary formalism and uh, how the boundary formalism connects uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, general relativity. I think that the philosophy here, so that the, the attitude here is really, uh, is really to, to move from, uh, um, from the idea that uh, in order to do, to define the theory uh, is necessary to um, define it uh, asymptotically, so at infinity. Uh, so move from this uh, to uh, a formulation of the theory in which I can talk about the finite regions and do the physics of these finite regions. So asymptotic reasoning works uh, very well, it could be very fruitful, but it has also limitation because it has to do with infinities that are, uh, uh, again, they are uh, signposts for, uh, <laughs> uh, for meaning something very large, something very distant. So so they really, they allow us to dis disregard part of uh, the problem, but they are also a way in which we, we lose <laughs> part of the information. And uh, some of the information that we may lose going uh, at, the sint at the infinity uh, may be the, 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 the most important content of the theory. So the, 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 the trend now uh, in, in uh, and the, what has opened the, the way of many results in quantum gravity was really, uh, let's forget about uh, infinity, let's see what's the physics uh, uh, here locally uh, in, for a finite region of space. And, um, uh, and the physics of boundaries is very, very rich. So there is, so there is this boundary formalism that, uh, um, that uh, it's of course uh, part of uh, the toolkit for loop quantum gravity, but uh, the boundary formalism is something that is revealing uh, uh, to be uh, very, very rich, not just for constructing quantum gravity. So in quantum gravity, you are somehow obliged to take this perspective. Uh, but it's also something that is allows, uh, allowing us to understand uh, uh, better and better uh, uh, our theories. So the effects of having a boundary uh, produce interesting physics, uh, uh, for instance, in the form of, uh, um, uh, of edge modes uh, or in the form of uh, um, uh, soft particles uh, in uh, in other uh, context of, uh, of physics, not just in the gravitational physics. And uh, it's uh, uh, probably uh, the key to understand the connection uh, between uh, uh, the theories and uh, the relational uh, ontology that is underlying. And uh, it's also a way to understand uh, better symmetries uh, in general, so we can recast the symmetries uh, in term and gauges uh, in terms of constraints as emerging from constraints or partitions uh, and see how all the different uh, uh, symmetry that we see from the young mills one, the different variant ones, uh, or even uh, the, the, the symmetry that comes, uh, that is the Hamiltonian one, that uh, uh, produce uh, the time evolution, uh, they, are, they are always, they are all of the same kind, all coming from partitions of the system and partitions, again, uh, uh, concern doing physics with a finite region and with finite systems. Um, okay, so, well, uh, this is a very long conversation <laughs> that opens up maybe a, an entire course uh, on this, but thank you for, for mentioning this because this is really uh, central. The other question that you were asking was about uh, quantum field theory, uh, the fact that uh, particles uh, uh, appear differently, uh, different uh, um, um, with respect, uh, depending on, for instance, in uh, 
in, um, in a on a curved background. And uh, you were asking about the vacuum of the theory. And uh, again, uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, a question that beg for uh, a clarification uh, at the level uh, of uh, uh, the classical theory and possibly again uh, uh, doing all the steps uh, uh, from, uh, um, from general relativity, putting uh, uh, quantum fields uh, uh, on uh, a curved geometry. And then uh, once you understand what is going on there, then uh, the passage to quantum gravity is natural. Uh, why? Because uh, of course, so what do you mean by vacuum? So the vacuum uh, uh, is um, where uh, uh, y you, uh, you cannot, uh, so the, the vacuum uh, really, so if you are in a curved background, uh, uh, the, uh, the vacuum is not unique, is any background geometry. So there is uh, possibly a, a, an infinite number of uh, vacua and, uh, and then you construct, you choose one, <laughs> you choose one and you construct the, uh, the vacua on it. In, gen in uh, loop quantum gravity, you can do the same in the sense that uh, um, if you wanted to work uh, in this way, you can take a given geometry. This given geometry could be, uh, for instance, Minkowski, or could be um, the De Sitter uh, geometry, uh, so the geometry with a, a constant curvature. And uh, uh, you can see how you can produce excitations uh, on, on this given geometry. But careful that, uh, so, uh, what we, so here we are mimicking what people do uh, with uh, quantum fields uh, with perturbations uh, and uh, and so perturbations implies having excitation on on a given uh, uh, on a given background so of course you can do the same in loop quantum gravity and this implies the choice <laughs> of the background geometry with which you you, you want to work so you can use uh, you can do that and uh, one should be careful that uh, there is a distinction between uh, doing this uh, and talking about uh, other form of, uh, uh, of, uh, of aqua in, uh, in quantum gravity. Because so what we are talking about uh, as, vacua, uh, as vacuum is just a given geometry. So the vacuum would be Minkowski or the vacuum could be um, the sitter. In loop quantum gravity, you have also another <laughs> sense in which you can talk about vacua. Uh, vacuum that is uh, uh, no geometry at all. So there is the so-called ashtekar levadovsky vacuum that is uh, where you take your quantum space-time and you annihilate all of them and you are without uh, space-time uh, at all. So that's another sense in which you can talk about uh, vacuum that is completely different than uh, the, the sense in which uh, we talk uh, in, in, uh, with respect to quantum field theory. Uh, and finally, uh, so you were asking uh, about uh, the relationship between uh, uh, taking a relational ontology and loop quantum gravity. Well, uh, I don't think uh, uh, that most of my colleagues working in loop quantum gravity um, really spend their days uh, thinking about uh, their uh, metaphysical uh, uh, commitments. Uh, so people, um, as you know, in the same way in which most physicists uh, don't think about uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, but um, but they still use quantum mechanics <laughs> for uh, their daily um, practice. So uh, I, I cannot tag uh, so much loop quantum gravity that is uh, such a huge field of research uh, to a specific uh, ontology, even though uh, uh, in its construction, of course, uh, um, the, uh, what I have tried to argue with my talk is the fact that uh, loop quantum gravity being uh, uh, a, a realization of uh, uh, general covariant quantum fields uh, inherit the ontology that comes from uh, uh, covariant fields and from uh, um, quantum fields. So that there is 
a relational ontology that is inherited from, uh, uh, from quantum field theory. There is a, an, an ontology that is inherited from uh, um, general relativity. And, uh, and when you try to put them together and you see what stays there, uh, what is common to all these uh, different theories, uh, uh, so that you can still bring it with you with quantum gravity, you realize that the only thing that you have is this relational ontology, in my opinion. Right, and then so now we have a tiny bit of time for discussion. Uh, who has questions? Plenty of questions. Okay, uh, so let me say the last one. <laughs> Just very quickly, um, and this came up also with Carlos' talk. Uh, so, when you talk about this regularization, this is fact that okay, in general, the spin, spin, um, spin network Church. that you have, uh, you know, this, you know, this, this loop is doesn't is not related to a space time. Right? It's just something that's abstract. But then, when you want to get the continuum approximation or the continuum mm -hmm. limit, you then embed it into something. Very similar to what we do in causal sets, mm -hmm. because in space time. Right? Yes. So the question that, and this is related to this regularization question, you know, when when this when the I mean, you have this very nice result about the fact that the spectra are discrete, does it not suggest that you do have a fundamental scale, and when you do this, you know, the the, the fact that you don't really don't need to go to the continuum limit, I and you could. In principle, uh, just do the kind of stuff that we do, of course, in the space time context, but in, in, a, in the spatial context, basically ask whether you can then yes. not go to that limit, but simply yes. stop. And as long as you have convergence in the sense that yeah. you know, uh, large end convergence, that's enough. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the question. Uh, no, it's not a question. It's a, a total. Uh, there is a total agreement here. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, there is a bit uh, of uh, a, a, a divergence in focus between uh, uh, people, in, even in the loop quantum gravity community. There are people who think that recovering uh, uh, the continuous limit is something important for uh, having the theory being well defined and there is a part of the community that think that this is uh, secondary uh, exactly because uh, uh, the fundamental aspects of the theory the great discovery of the theory is that there is a fundamental scale uh, so the world is discrete uh, and uh, what we have uh, in the classical limit is just an approximation of this uh, fundamental discrete uh, world so uh, yeah, I mean, I cannot <laughs> agree with more, more with you, even though I should say that uh, there are a lot of people doing uh, loop quantum gravity that uh, are completely narrow, uh, very narrowly focused in uh, reco recovering the continuous limit. And I think this is very, but I, I think this is very important uh, to emphasize also uh, with respect uh, uh, so we are also interested in comparisons between the different approaches to quantum gravity. So I think this is a, a nice point in which uh, causal sets and loop quantum gravity are similar. Uh, there are other approaches to, loop, uh, to quantum gravity, for instance, uh, in... Uh, so let me make an example. In uh, asymptotic safety, there is a cutoff in the theory. And uh, you can uh, think that, uh, so if you wanted to proceed like you do all the time in quantum field theory, you may think that you wanted to remove this cutoff in the end of your calculations. Or if you buy uh, the, the results from loop quantum gravity, or if you buy the general philosophy of thinking of quantum gravity as the discovery that there is a fundamental scale, you can say, oh, Okay, no, I don't want, I can remove the cutoff because I wanted to study the mathematical properties of the theory, but I, I believe that there is a physical meaning in this uh, cutoff. Or another example is uh, uh, causal dynamical triangulation. So in causal dynamical triangulation, people are obsessed uh, with uh, removing the discreteness of the theory. And this is uh, exactly one of the differences with respect to, uh, to quantum gravity. Uh, you don't want to <laughs> go all the way through and remove the discreteness because the discreteness is fundamental.
My question is about the states, the Hilbert space. Yep. The states. Um, so when I learned to do quantum gravity many years ago, yep. um, I learned that the state, as I remember it, the spin networks were embedded in a, in a three-dimensional sample. And part of the information of the state was topological embedding information. Yep. So for example, whether the edge of the, the, of the spin network was knotted in some way. Mm -hmm. so part, you know, part of the, the, the description of the state was just, for, for example, information about the knot, knottedness or not knottedness mm -hmm. of, the, uh, um, of the embedded um, edge. So as I understand it, this is not, this is a purely combinatorial yes. object. Yeah. Things have moved on, okay. and that is now a difference from the, let's say, historical foundations of new quantum science. This is a purely combinatorial. There is no topological. There's dimension information, which you said that's one of the inputs to yeah. because you have the Lorentz group with a, of a certain dimension. There's dimension information, but there is not topological information. Yeah. So in that sense, the manifold in the when you recover. The continuum in the continuum approximation, you will be able to recover the topology of the three-dimensional manifold. So you could get the free sphere, you could get the, mm -hmm. the three torus. Yep. You could get. Is that correct? Correct. You, so the same the same graph uh, can be embedded in different uh, manifolds. Could be a three sphere or could be a, so the the, the the same graph uh, could indeed uh, uh, be corresponding to different uh, topologies. But le so let me go step by step because y you were mentioning uh, the historical development of the theory. And uh, of course it's true that uh, historically loop quantum gravity started uh, as a theory quantizing general relativity, so starting with manifolds and chopping the manifold in pieces, uh, uh, very much as we do in uh, with the calculus. Uh, so going from the bottom down to the quantum level, and what I am presenting is uh, going from the bottom, uh, trying to recover the top. Uh, so I think that this is a nice feature of the theory that uh, people have been able to look how to go from one direction to the other, or, or I don't know, <laughs> all possible directions. Of course, you, um, I, I do think uh, that uh, this way of presenting the theory is more clear because we think that uh, this quantum level is somehow more fundamental, the level in which there is the discreteness and so on is what is underlying. Um, uh, but of course, uh, this is, uh, as I was stressing, uh, the, the theory knows about the top <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, the, the gauge variables that I have, uh, the dimensionality that I have, uh, they are all understood uh, coming from uh, this uh, 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 Hamiltonian uh, um, formulation of general relativity to start, so from the classical theory to start with. Uh, then you, you were asking uh, um, specifically uh, about uh, the topology. I think that uh, one of the other changes that have been going on in the past uh, 20 years <laughs> in the theory is really not to think about this uh, single nodes uh, as being uh, elementary uh, Planckian quanta, but as a cos grain. So this graph can represent uh, one, uh, three, uh, six, nine uh, 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 Planck volume, but I can use the same graph also to represent the whole universe. So I can decide, for instance, that I want to describe the universe um, uh, truncating the degrees of freedom to these uh, nine uh, spatial, uh, separated spatial regions. Uh, I mean, it, when we do cosmology, uh, we, we would, uh, um, the standard cosmology is just one degree of freedom. So if I do 
something that corresponds to this kind of graph, this kind of lattice. I am already doing something that is much more rich. And so if I think about this state as a cos grain or some underlying geometry, I mean, this could be, uh, 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 could be everything. So now the topology, the topology. So if I think about this as a cos grain, there could be some underlying very complicated uh, quantum states with, uh, I don't know, uh, holes uh, and uh, all possible uh, uh, exotic topologies, but uh, in my coarse grained uh, representation, well, this corresponded just to a smooth uh, topology like uh, a trisphere, for instance. Um, there is a way in which uh, you can uh, uh, import more information in your states. So if instead of uh, having uh, your spin network states uh, with just this quantum number, you add one more quantum number that, could, that brings the information about the topology. Well, this is an extension of loop quantum gravity that allows you also to track the topology. And for instance, when you do the evolution of uh, your geometry, for instance, you can see whether your uh, two sphere is going into, I don't know, like a pent uh, <laughs> uh, topology or something, or, or like creating a hole uh, some, somewhere. You can, you can do this kind of thing. You can do a topology change uh, if you want. The thing is that we, we are usually, when we compute uh, physical, uh, physically interesting processes, like we want to, for in my, in my case, for instance, I want to have an initial state that is a contracting universe and the final state that is uh, an expanding universe. All I am interested in is to have a graph that is sufficiently uh, rich and not uh, so strange so that it can be embedded, uh, say, in a tree sphere. Um, and, uh, and this is, all I require. So, I mean, yes, there are always more complicated things that can be done, but when I compute things, this is all I need. All right, uh, we have five minutes for questions. So, someone wants to go first? Uh, yeah, just, just a quick point of clarification. Um, what is the geometry that you have at the fundamental level? What is the geometry? The geometry, yeah. Can you just say a little bit more about what geometry you have? Um, not in the, the, the limits, but just yeah. fundamentally. Uh, so, okay, so the, um, it depends on what you mean by geometry. So uh, I, the, 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 what codes really this notion of geometry, as I was saying at the beginning, is the fact that, uh, so I, I have a quanta, my, say one node, my quanta of space, so there is a quantum number associated with this that uh, uh, will be uh, corresponding to eigenvalues of, uh, of volume. And uh, I have uh, links uh, coming out uh, from uh, this uh, node. So each, uh, each of these links is connecting with uh, some other piece of, uh, of my spin network. And uh, the way in which I can think of this uh, is that uh, each of these link is telling me uh, with, uh, uh, with whom this quanta is in interaction with. So like uh, this quanta is, in, or like uh, this region of space is inter in interaction with another region of space. How much are they interacting? Well, you know, in, quantum f in, quant in the quantum theory, uh, in order to express uh, how much uh, what, how things are interacting, we use a quantity that is the cross-section. And here there is a cross-section that we express indeed as an area, or actually what we mean by area is the cross-section given by the interaction between these two different regions. So I have cross-section areas here. So each of these has some quantum number, J1, J2, J3, uh, J4, J5. So each of these pins uh, is quantifying how much uh, interaction there is between these regions, namely is, in, is telling me how much area there is, uh, is uh, shared between these two regions. So, as I, and then there is uh, 
here, let me call it a, a quantum number that tells me um, the volume. So the geometry is given by a node that knows about the volume of this region, by spins uh, that knows about uh, uh, the, the area. And then, uh, so the, the areas are really constructed out of the fundamental operators that comes from uh, the, uh, the densitized triads. So, so these objects uh, are the fundamental pieces with which I can construct the, not, not only the, the area operator that has discrete spectrum, but also the, the volume operator that has also discrete spectrum. I can construct angle operators, uh, and in particular, I can uh, define uh, four dimension angles uh, between uh, a poly this uh, polyhedral region here with respect to this other polyhedral um, and there could be something else here. So there is uh, a four dimensional angles uh, between uh, those two that I can define and this four dimensional angles is nothing by what tells me about the curvature. That, so I go from, if I, if I, take my con I, 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 I take my connection of the gravitational field and in this region and I parallel transport uh, uh, the, the connection uh, here in, uh, in this other region and uh, the, the, the connection is uh, rotated by an angle that tells me how much curvature there is. Thank you. Right. So we are over time, but if you can make a brief, brief question, brief answer, then let me go to Thank you very much for the, for the talk. Great. Uh, very brief question again about the ontology. Uh, I was the intention somehow when the, the theory is presented between this parameter representation about uh, about uh, but as we just discussed, these are, are combi abstract combinational structures, and uh, moreover, we have actually quantum superposition of these at the, oh. at the quantum level as well. So, and, and you talk about the, the fuzziness also of, 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 of this of this uh, ontology somehow. So, what's the, fuzz the fuzziness about what? What is fuzzy? And what's the relationship between this best description in terms of fuzziness, fuzziness of something, it seems, and the radical uh, relational uh, uh, ontology? So what is the relationship between this fuzziness and, and the, the relational... Uh, I feel this is a question uh, that needs to be answered at the level of quantum mechanics. Because, so this is a... So once you understand what's going on in quantum... Me in quantum mechanics, you have the same thing. There is uh, uh, relationality and there is fuzziness. Where is the fuzziness? The fuzziness comes from the fact that uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, comes uh, with uh, two aspects that are one dual to the other, uh, discreteness and the superposition. The superposition is what, uh, so the discreteness uh, 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 implies that you have operators and these operators uh, don't commute to one another and brings the fuzziness and the fuzziness also is manifested in the fact that you have a superposition so and uh, so but this is something that is uh, at the core of quantum mechanics and it, it translates uh, exactly directly into the quantum mechanical system uh, of gravity quantum states, um, it has geometrical quantity described if they don't commute, okay? Like the angular momentum of an atom in quantum mechanics, uh, the different components don't commute. What does it mean? It means that by itself it doesn't have three components of angular momentum. When it interacts with something where the component in the z, z direction is relevant, the component in the z direction has a specific value. It's not parallel. So every time it's realized uh, in an interaction, there's conflictuality. So the eigenvalue comes out as the element of reality, that's the ontology, in the interaction. But the others are not defined, no. because if JZ is defined, the others are okay? Which means that if later on you interact with something else, you go into distribution, and then it's the other one which becomes. Okay. So exactly the same as for computing. Exactly the same has to be solved here. The Geometry of this thing here, measured precisely, is not a sharp geometry, 
has the same values, it describes the same variables as usual geometry, but these are weak. So some of them, when you measure it, when you interact with something else, are sharp. But then the others in the mathematics cannot be sharp because this is a group, this is a state, which is the eigenstate of this is not an eigenstate of that. So from, from the ontology perspective, now weren't you saying before that it makes no sense to to uh, to ask or to even uh, talk about <laughs> things uh, in the field of daily yeah, interaction? Right. That's correct. So why you say there is no superposition? There is only outcome of measurements. And mm -hmm. what you mean by superposition is that uh, uh, if I at this point would interact, then there would be a probability of interaction. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.